Did, did your water say on? And your heat's okay? Huh? Your heat? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm lucky. A lot of people lost water. Yeah. Yeah. My brother lost water. Well, it froze in the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah, we had frozen pipes in the Greensburg church. We had to deal with they broke. Yeah. Oh, what a mess. Oh, yeah, it was big. Yeah. Did it flood? Yeah. It did. Of course, huh? Of course. But we're cleaning up. Yeah. Once you find the leak, that's half the problem. What? Once you find the leak, that's half the problem. Then you yeah. Can get it fixed. But until you find it. Not too many people here, huh? No. Where all the people go? Well, it is New Year's Day. Probably a lot of sleeping in. <laughs> all right, I'm going to do an ask. They're tired. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. And Happy New Year to everyone. Thanks for being here today. We got a much nicer, warmer day today. Not not super warm, but decent. So happy for that. Uh, just a couple of announcements to begin. The altar flowers are given to the glory of God and in honor of Debbie's birthday. And they're given by Wendy and Sam. So happy birthday. Is it today? Wednesday. 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 Uh, the flower chart's already up in the hall, so you can see the new flower chart. Uh, some folks have been filling in already, so if you have a date you really like, please uh, get to it quickly so you can get that one. Uh, Hunger Action is still looking for soup and crackers, hot drinks, etc., and all of that's right out here in the narthex. You can uh, load up those items. Uh, consistory meets tomorrow at 7. And as we did last year and the year before, if we have severe weather, check channel 11, WPXI, for cancellations. They should be online uh, or on TV by 8 a.m. And I think they do it online, too. I've never checked the, the website, but I think they're on there, too. It's online also. So if you get up and you don't have channel 11, just go. You can check it online as well. And uh, so then you know before you leave the house if we're going to be here. So if you don't see anything online or on TV, we're probably going to be here. Uh, the prayer list has been restarted for the new year. So if there was somebody on before you want to continue on, please let us know at the office and we'll put them back on. Excuse me, put them back on. And again, with new folks, same thing. Please call in for that. Uh, the mitten tree is still out here. And there's still plenty of room on it if you want to pick up some gloves and hats and so forth uh, for the mitten tree. I'm not sure how long we keep that up. How long is the mitten tree up till? Mitten tree? Um, whenever. Whenever. The deadline is... Okay. Okay. Next week. So... If you have something you bought already, please bring it in. If you didn't, get, get out to the store and get that stuff in uh, for next week. Anything else anyone would like to share this morning? Yes. All decorations over, over to the hall. Okay. Anything else? And at this time, we'll continue with the ringing of the bell and our prelude.
have received in faith that which you, O Lord, have promised. Emmanuel, God with us, God in us, revealed to us. Our souls rejoice in the salvation of the Lord. The Lord will be our everlasting light and glory. Praise and glory be to you now and forevermore. Please join in the invocation. Exalted God, even as our heavenly host sang of your glory, in the night skies over Bethlehem, even as the star shone in the heavens and the sheep and cattle gathered in that light, so we gather, young and old together, to recount all that you have done for us in mercy and steadfast love. No tyrant's threat or deadly act can destroy the dreams and visions you have placed within us, for you have drawn us close with all creation, we praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. Amen. Please join me for what hymn 150.
became like us in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. As we confess our sins, we come before the one who is also tempted by what he suffered, confident that he is able to help us. Please join in a prayer of confession. Oh God, uh -huh. forgive, forgive the times we look with a cynical eye on the advent of peace in our world. Forgive us for doubting the light you have placed within each of us. Forgive us for ignoring the lump in our throats and the wonder of your love for us. With the birth of Christ's child, let us forgive you cleanse the darkness of our inner selves and let the love and joy of Christ shine in us like a star. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord's kindness and mercy is abundant and pours over us as we offer our prayers of repentance. We are forgiven. Amen. Please join me in our Christmas affirmation of faith as it's printed in the bulletin. I believe in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the source of all light and life. I believe that God sent Jesus Christ as the Word incarnate into this world so that all might be bathed in his light and know the true source of life. On the witness of the disciples, I believe that Jesus was crucified died and was buried, and brought back to life, that we might also have new life in him. I believe the word of God still speaks today to those who have ears and hearts to listen. I believe with the power of the Holy Spirit that my life can be a witness to God's living presence and grace. Amen. You may be seated. We have joys and concerns we'd like to share this morning. I have concerns. Um, we all know that life has a great deal of work that we can do in the past few years. But my mother in law was reminded of them all as we crossed our Christmas Eve. So she fell on Christmas Eve oh. and fell on the walking fell on Christmas Eve. And I was downstairs watching the football game. Every time I put mass, I just thought she was surging. And Franklin Harris was starting all day on. Oh, right. Oh, boy. Oh. What, and what's her name? Oh. What's, what's her name? Sandy. Sandy. And others? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the joy and the delivering power of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you give to us and that we celebrate 
on the Christmas holiday. We thank you for that great gift and that great miracle that his life provides to us. We also thank you for the guidance that he gives to us, the shepherding that we need. Lord, we ask that you constantly be with us in our times and celebrations of joy. May we lift our voices and our hearts with thanksgiving to you always. And Lord, we thank you again for being with us during times of trials and illnesses. We thank you for being with Sandy after she had this broken leg. Lord, we ask that you bring her healing and recovery, new strength and new life and hope. We pray for Heather as well, that you continue to deliver her on a process of healing. Lord, we pray for all those who are facing these sufferings and other problems during this season. We thank you again for all of those folks and families who have been able to travel and visit relatives and friends and family. We thank you for those visits. We thank you for delivering people safely to their destinations and home again. We are thankful that people whose travels were interrupted by weather have now safely made it home in most of the places. Lord, we thank you again for this wonderful Christmas season. And as we celebrate a new calendar year, we ask that you fill our hearts with hope and with joy and with anticipation of the wonders you will do next. We thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Please remain seated for our next hymn, number 162.
Our first lesson this morning is from Jeremiah chapter 3. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest places of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by the brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble, for I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd of flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice and dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. And our gospel lesson from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all the people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God the the only Son who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my message be pleasing to you and reflect your will in our lives. Amen. It's become kind of my New Year's tradition, if you will, to, to share another piece of scripture from 2 Peter chapter 3. It's about time, and it's about how we relate to time and how God relates to time. Do not ignore this one fact, my beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth that everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of people ought to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting and hastening for the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements melt with fire? But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. It's that time of year again. 
when we change the calendar. And for some reason, that always sparks something within us. I don't know what makes December 31st that much different from January 1st, other than maybe you're a little extra tired this morning from being up last night. But what does it really mean? I'm not sure it really means much of anything except, you know, our, our calendar starts over again, our book work starts over, all these kinds of things. Just pick a day, and that's how it starts. So we look at the beginning of the year as a special day. We've made it special. In the Bible, the years followed a very different kind of calendar and so forth, so they didn't have a New Year's like we have New Year's now. They had celebration, but we've, we've changed it. We've adapted to a different way of thinking. And one of the things that we do for New Year's, a tradition, at least in our country, is to make resolutions. And I've kind of given up on that. I never keep them. I have to admit, I always have good intentions. But over the years, I've come to realize they never make it past February, at least the ones I, I, I think, you know, the common ones. Oh, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to save money. I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. None of that happens. I told my son, I said, after New Year's, we're going to clean the garage. And he looked at me and he goes, okay, Dad. Because I know, he knows in his mind, that's never going to happen. It won't happen until maybe summertime. And then it won't be a big deal. So we know. We make resolutions, but really, do they really matter to us? Well, we should be thinking about our faith. Advent is the beginning of the church year. So a couple of weeks ago when we started Advent, we began a new year for the church. And that year begins, of course, with the birth of Christ, anticipation and then the birth of Christ. So for us, Christmas is more like a new year, a new beginning for us. So we should frame our new year around our faith. At least that's my suggestion for you, because that's something that we can resolve to do together, and we can make it happen together. But there are lots of things we can do to improve our faith and to make our journey a little bit better. Do you reconcile yourself with God? Do we take that time? I think that's something that we can do. We can all see the physical things we need to change in our lives. We all know what those things are. And those things haven't changed from December to January, at least for most of us they haven't. So we know we have to do those things. But spiritually, we have a chance to start over. Advent was the preparation for the Christ. Now we're here. Christ is born. We celebrate. We commemorate that wonderful occurrence. Now it's time to make that real. But how do we go about that? How do we work together to do that? I think a lot of uh, resolutions fail because we try to do them on our own. We try to make them happen by ourselves. We decide we're going to lose weight. Well, you know, you could say that on January 1st, but what happens when you get home and the pork roast is done? And all of those things are, I mean, that, that diet's right out the window. So you say, I'll start next week. Well, that doesn't work so much either. Next week brings its own issues and things. So it's easy to fall away from those things. But when we work together, we can resolve to do things that will enlighten everyone and lift us all up. Most of us pray often, at least I hope we do. And some people pray every single day. Some people have a set time. Maybe you have a set time when you like to speak to God. Or maybe it's just when the mood strikes you, you speak to God. Or maybe there are just times when you're overwhelmed and you need a moment to speak to God. But prayer, no matter how often it is, is an important part of our relationship with God. It's a discussion. And it's ongoing. Sometimes we think of prayers as beginning and ending. We start the prayer, Heavenly Father, dear God, something like that, and then we end with Amen. But that's the simple answer. That's not the entire truth. Prayer is really a conversation. It's long and it's drawn out and it lasts our entire lives. When we begin to pray, it's something that we open up to God and we continue all the time. It's always there. We're always open in prayer. I don't know how many of you like to text on your phone. Sometimes you have running text messages. Does anybody have that where you've been texting with somebody, a family member or a friend or something, and that text message is a conversation that if you look back on it, 
doesn't seem very long because it's only little tiny blurbs, but it might go for weeks, back and forth, back and forth. I see some blank looks and I see some people nodding. So some people don't text that much, but trust me, that's the way it looks like. You see the same conversation. My wife read something funny about texting. She said, marriage is texting someone what to bring home from the grocery store until one of you dies. And I thought, okay, we laugh because it's true. We keep texting each other all the time. Did you pick up this? Did you get that? Did you get this? It's more than that. But prayer is a conversation that never truly ends. It continues throughout our lives. And we do it not only as individuals, but we can do it together. When we come to worship, we say prayers together. When I pray and lead us in prayer, that's a time that we all lift our voices to God together. And we can say the same thing. But even, even while we're praying the same thing together, you may have different thoughts about what that prayer means to you. And you are conveying that, whether you realize it or not, you're conveying that message to God. Each time we say the Lord's Prayer, we should be thinking about what those words mean to ourselves. And they might mean something a little bit different to each one of us. And it might mean something different to you every time you say it. And that's just part of the conversation. It's part of how we communicate with God. It's not simply making demands of God, which sometimes we think that's what it is. We think we go before God and we make a request, like calling up the radio station and saying, I want to hear a song. We pray to God and say, I want this or I want that. I want healing. I want this. I want that. It's prayer is more than that. Prayer is an extension of that, beyond all of that. We're a society of folks who like things to be quick. We want things to be fast and easy. We want instant gratification. How many of you ordered stuff online for Christmas? Maybe from Amazon, a couple people order stuff. Two-day guarantee. And boy, you know, you like to cut it close. And if it's more than two days, you get mad. Where is it? Send a message back. Where's my stuff? We demand things to be instant. When we go to the store because we see something in the paper that they have on sale, if they don't have it, we get upset. We want it right away. We don't want a rain check. We don't want it later. We want it now. And that's the way we think. We've been taught to expect things to happen immediately. And we expect the same of God. God doesn't deliver in 24 hours like UPS or we get our money back. We simply don't send our prayers by FedEx. It doesn't work that way. God has a time and a place for everything. And we fit into his schedule, not the other way around. But that's hard for us to understand. Our scripture lesson reminds us to be patient with God just as God is patient with us. And God is certainly patient with us. When you look at the world and things around us, you have to remind yourself God is very, very patient. Otherwise, we would be in big, big trouble. But that doesn't work that way. God doesn't answer to a timetable that we create. He answers to his own. And as the passage from 2 Peter said, a thousand years are like one day to God. Well, that can be tough, tough news for us to hear because a thousand years is a really long time to us. And it's, of course, well beyond our lifetime, well beyond 10 lifetimes of a human being. So if we say we're going to pray today and the answer is going to come in a thousand years, what are you going to say to that? Well, thanks for nothing. That's how we think. That's, that's how we've been trained to think. But we have to remember that our prayers are always heard. And I believe they're always answered. We just don't always get the answer we want or the answer we expect. And we don't always get it exactly when we think it's going to be delivered. And that's a tough challenge for us to do. So we have to be patient with God, just as God is patient with us. The reality makes me think we just keep praying. We just keep praying all the time. We keep that conversation open and we temper our requests and our promises to those things that will bless our families bless our communities, bless the church universal, bless all of humanity. When we ask for those kinds of things, we won't be disappointed. Even in the midst of tragedy, we can see God's hand working for the better. When people have tragedies and problems in their lives, we pray for them because we feel that God will reach out to them with new strength and new renewal, that our voices together have an impact, that we are called not only to 
persuade God, which I don't know if God needs persuading, but we are the ones that get persuaded to serve and to help. When we pray for other people, that may be what God does is work in our lives to serve them as well. So that's why we keep praying all the time. We keep that line of conversation open with God. Most resolutions are individual and specific to our own needs, but we need to broaden our borders, encompass those around us. Say to ourselves, well, my resolution is going to be to help more people this year. I'm going to reach out to more people. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know where I'm going to do it, but somehow I'm going to ask God to open those doors for me. And you'll find that there are lots of people that we can help. Sometimes we get this idea that we, we are beyond helping somebody else, that we can't do it all, so we choose to do nothing. And that's a difficult place to be in. We realize that we can impact lives around us, maybe one or two, but that's important to do. We have to avoid that desire for instant gratification and asking God for immediate blessings and then pouting when they don't show up on our doorstep after 24 hours. We're looking toward a new year for humanity, a new year for the church, and it's time to ask God's favor and beg for grace and mercy. We can plainly see that we need it. We all need it as individuals. We need it as community. We need it as an entire species created by God because we have been living in an imperfect state, and we're continuing to be that way. But God overcomes our deficiencies and helps us make things better. We should pray for peace and harmony in the world. And we think that that's a, that's a no-brainer. We want peace and harmony in the world. Yet so often we see the exact opposite happen. But we got to keep at it. We got to keep praying. Not just when, the, when something strikes us and we see something on the news that reminds us that the world is not at peace, but all the time speaking to God saying, please let there be peace in Europe. Let there be peace in Asia. Let there be peace in the Americas. Everywhere in the world there's something going on where we need to ask for God's peace. We should pray that God is working in that way, working toward that regard, because other people are praying the same thing. And I think there's more power when we pray those things together, because not only does it encourage God, it strengthens the bond we have with each other and with God. And that's an important thing. As we pray for a new year, we have to be thankful for what we already have. And that's something that, that we think should be a no-brainer. We, we even have a holiday we call Thanksgiving, where we say we're going to be thankful to God for everything. But we have to be thankful for God to God all the time and for everything. You may look back at 2022 and say, well, there are things I'm very thankful for, and there are some things I am not happy about. But we have to be thankful that at least we at least made it through those things, or that at least we're trying to overcome. At least we're moving in one direction. We should be thankful that we have the opportunity to see 2023. And it can be difficult for us to do that. Do we look at the world and say, our glass is half full or is it half empty? And if we choose to make it half full, we can ask God to keep pouring in his spirit. And that tops it off for us. But it's difficult and it's challenging for us to do, especially if we have pessimism in our hearts. We have to kind of drive that away. We should remember God's grace in the last 2,000 years before demanding mercy in the next thousand. The last year has had good, great, bad, terrible moments, and we should thank God for each and every one of them. We should thank God for his presence. When we pray, when we say those words from John chapter 1, we pray and we recognize Jesus as the word of God come to us. We need to make that real in our minds and in our hearts, remembering that Jesus did become all of creation for us, and he is still with us. And it means there's a lot of things for us to do. God has made a resolution of redemption to us through Jesus Christ. And the day will come we'll be gathered into that divine kingdom or scattered to the wind. And the day will come like a thief in the night, as the scriptures say. It's not marked on any calendar. We don't know what the next couple of weeks or months or days or even hours will bring in 2023. But all we know is that God is with us in all of those moments. So that if we choose to be with God, we'll always be on the right path. It may be difficult for us to understand and accept, but that's what we're called to do. 
We should continue to work for the future of humanity and of the church. And we all have to do our share of the labor. And that's a tough thing, too, because we don't all have the same gifts and same talents. So we think to ourselves, well, maybe I'm not doing as much as somebody else. Or maybe they're not doing as much as I am. But God has given us each something to bring to the table. Each of us something to bring in to labor. Everything has its own opportunities and challenges. And if we use the talents and the gifts we've been given properly, we can each share in our portion of the work that God has to give. So we come together and we pray. And it's always a good idea to pray and pray often, bring our concerns to God, and God will, by the Holy Spirit, give us an answer at some point, in some fashion, but we have to be ready to hear it. It's one thing to ask a question, but are we silent enough to hear the answer? How many times have you spoken to someone or they've spoken to you and they ask questions but don't give you a time to answer? I can remember I had a teacher like that way back who would just fire off questions and you never had time to answer or even think about what that was until the next question came. And I can remember being frustrated because after all the questions were over, I thought, I don't know anything. I didn't learn anything. And maybe that was just me, but I think that frustration can happen. So not only do we ask things of God, but we have to listen for the answer and the response. So when we come in prayer, we should think of it as conversation where you have to speak and listen. It's easy for us to speak before God and give a list of, of things that we want. It's like writing that letter to Santa. That's how some people think of prayer. We just write the letter. It's our wish list. We fill in the blanks. This is what we want, and we hand it over, and that's the end of it. But it's not. Prayer is a conversation that we have about all things with God. We pray together and we pray often so that we come to have some understanding of God in our lives. We gather together to worship as well, and we do that for a very important reason because we are much stronger together than we are separate. We can carry each other. We can make resolutions as individuals, but it's going to be very difficult to keep them outside of joining together to keep them. If we make a resolution as a congregation, as a church, as a denomination, as the universal church, we're much more likely to be successful in keeping it. We're much more likely to support one another. Do you know, have you ever been on a diet and you have a diet buddy, somebody that's doing the same thing you are? My wife was doing that on an app, and she had a, a diet partner that she was with that she no, didn't know, had no idea, didn't even know where this person was. But they would send messages back and forth through this app about how they were doing. And I thought, well, that's a great idea. You know, I want a piece of cake. No, you don't. You know, that kind of thing. Well, it, you, we laugh, but it's helpful. It really does help. And prayer can be the same way. Service and worship can be that same way. We can lift each other up. You may come into church not really feeling that spirit, but if somebody else is feeling it, it'll be contagious, and it'll come on to you, and you'll feel that power, and you'll feel lifted up by the strength of someone else. There are lots of folks I've encountered over the years who will tell me their faith is private. It's no one else's business. My faith is my own. I don't talk about it. I don't do anything. I don't show it. True Christian faith is always personal, but it's never private. Private means it's secret, or it's reserved only for a certain group. The gospel is not top secret. It's not for authorized people only. It's for everyone. So if you think you're doing some favor to God by keeping your faith private, by keeping it hidden so that no one else sees it, you're really masking its true power, and you're hiding it from someone. It's Jesus described it as put, lighting a lamp and placing it under a bowl. You wouldn't turn on a light and then cover it completely so that it doesn't shine anywhere. It's pointless. It's useless. The light may be on, it may be off. It doesn't make any difference. When I was a kid, my brother and I would try to figure out if the refrigerator light stayed on. So we would open the door real gently, trying to see how far we could open it before we could see if the light was still on. Because we didn't know. We assumed that the light was always on because every time you opened the door, it was on. But my mother said, no, it shuts off when the door's closed. Well, other than climbing into the refrigerator, which we didn't try, we were smarter than that. But there it is. We wanted to know what it was like, but we couldn't see it. We couldn't see it. 
in that way. But the gospel is something like that as well. The light shines out, but only when the door is open, only when the shades are lifted, only when the curtains are drawn, if you will. All of those things, it has to be shown. Our faith can be personal, meaning it's deep within our hearts, but it's not private. It's not meant to be hidden. We're called to live and serve God publicly as community. No one believer is a church by himself. No one believer holds some power over or sway over God that someone else doesn't. I've had lots of people say to me over the years, well, I want you to pray for me, meaning me, Pastor Steve, because God hears your prayers more than mine. And I tell them, I'm telling you right now, that is not true. God hears everybody, and he's, those voices are all equal. You pray, and God hears you. You don't need somebody else to pray for you, but you need somebody to pray with you, somebody to join you, and that I'm happy to do. But to say that someone else should do the praying because I'm not good at that, that's like saying you're not good at just communicating or being with somebody. And prayer doesn't have to be a skill that you have some natural talent for. Prayer is something that we develop by practice and by doing it often. We serve together by gathering our blessings. And we know ministry is not cheap. It's not easy. It's not quick. Members have to contribute money, hard work, and time to complete the Great Commission. And that's everything, everybody. We all have something to give. God has made us into people with gifts that we are called to share. And we need all of those things together. We can't pretend that we don't need one and that we can make up for it with the others. It doesn't work that way. All gifts are from God and we'll be asked to account for all that we've received. And no one wants to go before God and explain why they gave too little to their faith, why they gave too little time, why they gave too little effort, saying, well, I was too busy, or I didn't have this, or I didn't have that. That's not the way it is. Members are called to add life to the church. And by adding life to the church, the surprising and the wonderful gift is that we get more back, always. Everything we bring before God is multiplied, and that includes our faith and our prayers and our are all of those wonderful gifts that God gives to us, the blessings, what we bring before is multiplied and generates more than we could ever imagine giving. The church is more than a building on the corner. We know that. It's the living body of Jesus Christ on earth. We are the hearts and hands of the people. It is the people that make the church, not bricks and stone. And we have to remember that when it's time to do work as well, when it's time to serve the community. It's our hands that do the work. It's us. We are the church. Our little banner out there in the, in the fellowship hall, I think it's still on the wall. I haven't looked lately. But it's out there. It says, we are the church. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we talk about the church like it's separate from us. When we talk about the church, we're really talking about us and say, well, the church does this and the church does that. And I fall into that same category. I make the same mistake. But we have to stop for a moment and think. When we talk about the church, we're talking about ourselves. If the church has a problem, that means we have a problem. If the church has a strength, that means we have a strength to celebrate and to use. We are the heralds of the gospel. And we've got to remember that. We're the spokespeople. We're the ones selling the message, if you will. The disciples understood this. Jesus made them understand it. God shares the good news, the story of the good news of, of Christ through us. The gospel is, if the gospel is not visible in our society, we're the ones that are to blame. And it's really easy to sit back and say, well, everybody's falling away and, and this doesn't happen and this doesn't happen like it used to. Well, those, those accusations come right back to us. We're the ones called to be the message bearers. We're the ones called to share the message. Have you ever seen something happen in town and you look in the paper the next day and there's nothing about it? And you could say to yourself, well, why doesn't anybody talk about it? Well, the gospel is kind of like that. It happens, but we have to share the message. And that's something that we have to make a resolution together to do. We are commanded to share the gospel with all the world. And all of us, not just clergy and leaders and staff and all that, we're called to share the message of hope for humanity. And that means everybody. And maybe you're not comfortable doing the same thing that I do or somebody else does, but it doesn't mean that you don't have a part to play. And maybe the part you play is simply offering to pray with someone 
or offering to bring them to worship or offering to introduce them to me or somebody. Maybe that's what we do. But we all have a part that we can play. If we keep our resolutions real and close to our hearts and close to God, then we will certainly be blessed in our new year. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for bringing us to another new year. As we celebrate this change of calendar, we ask that you open our hearts and minds and remind us that we always have an opportunity to serve you and to begin again through the power of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask now that you help us to claim that power, to follow the path that he has set before us, and to lead others and ourselves on the path that we have to be on. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, let us bring forth our tithes and offerings. Forty-three. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can't even see today. show you our gratitude and our love and concern, we share with you in the church the first fruits of our labor, along with our time and our discipleship, as we live to serve you and to share your gospel message with the world. We ask, Lord, that you accept all of our gifts and help us to use them properly as we fulfill this mission. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please join me in our closing hymn number 143.
May the new year bring you joy and peace. May God bless you all. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.